Welcome everyone to the latest edition of our Reimagining Mobility podcast series. I'm here with Phil Schnell from our technical center in California. Phil, you've been with AVL for a long time. You've led a lot of different projects uh, from a project management, coordination, build, and lots of things, probably oftentimes, many times the guy that's in the background, but making it happen together with the engineers and with your experience that you yourself are bringing. I want to talk a little bit about uh, with you today about the aviation project, not necessarily mm-hmm. about the battery and, uh, and the controls and the battery software that we put together for this very exciting uh, aerospace program. But I want to talk about what did it actually take, right? Mm-hmm. From a, from a, we had to manufacture these batteries. We had to come up with new processes, with new testing and validation, with a with a totally new approach in some cases and how we put things together and how we design it. And I know you were in the background or in the forefront, depending on what you want to say, uh, in, in, in all of this. So tell me a little bit, what did it mean to put a battery program, to lead a battery program right. for the aerospace industry versus for what you've done many times for the passenger vehicle or heavy duty truck space? Certainly. It, it was it was definitely a, a departure from what we normally do. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, auto, automotive uh, and some even stationary uh, support generation is what AVL is typically known for. Um, going into the e- aviation space was a bit of a, a bit of a, a, a long, a long stretch for all of us. We knew yeah. that there were going to be differences. Um, but even with the anticipation of what we had and then and, and the uh, the research that we did and how to get into the industry, there were still some things that that were uh, uh, that were catches as as we went through. Um, the the things that we knew that were going to be uh, a bit of a, a stretch for us were the requirements, um, specifically for the 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 first the first flight requirement was is higher for an airplane, obviously, than it is for an automotive vehicle. You can't pull off on the side of the road uh, with an airplane as, as you can with a car. So the, the, the safety and the redundancies were, were imp- that were implemented were much different than what we would normally expect. That was one of the things that we anticipated. Um, the other thing was just the safety requirements to get the thing up into the air. Mm-hmm. Um, automotive vehicles, as you know, have a particular acceptance of if there's a problem or an issue uh, to allow a battery um, to be, uh, de-energized safely, I guess would be the right way to say it on the road. Um, airplanes don't have that. You basically have to protect the battery and the rest of the electrified system if there is a problem with any one of the individual cells. So oh. increasing the safety level and the testing um, and the, the the dependency of the batteries was was a big deal. Um, um, so those two are the th- things we really understood. A little more of a nebulous item that was the the documentation and the proof that we were doing what we were doing. Uh, AVL isn't really a manufacturing company, um, but for an airplane, we did have to produce uh, over a hundred of these battery cassettes, which was a, a, a big level of work for us. So producing that volume of product in an organization of ourselves that's used to more of a prototyping approach, that was a bit of a learning curve for us as well. So those two or three things we really knew going in but it was working very closely with aviation to achieve all of those goals is really where we ended up growing. Um, mm. as, as I said, we're, we're a prototyping organization at, at heart here. Um, so we had to expand our capabilities to do the manufacturing. And in that we did have to add, you know, we knew that there were going to be operation description pages. We're going to be pad documents to build everything. But the level of detail that we had to generate to produce all of those was much more than we expected. Um, just the pure physical labor of building a hundred, uh, more than a hundred of these of these cassettes, even though you you know that it's going to be a lot of work uh, when you're sitting there looking at that many parts. Remembering these these cassettes are are 800 volts, so there's nearly 200 individual battery cells in each cassette times 100 cassettes. Just the sheer volume was was overwhelming to all of us. So bringing in people, working with working with uh, new employees, doing the assemblies, doing adding inspections as we went along. And again, because it was it was the first application of a uh, I should say the first large scale, larger scale application of a, of a prototyping approach, 
you ended up you ended up learning a lot of things and adding in, in intermediate inspections and procedures that you hadn't necessarily anticipated before. So you learn you learn something, take a step, three steps forward, one step sideways, uh, and then adapt, and then have to readdress. So those things that were anticipated but probably not completely comprehended um, was really the growth and the, and the learnings that we went through during the past, um, the, the year that it took to uh, go from the original contract through the build and then support aviation for their first flight. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you had to take, let's say, or if you had to make a statement about what were the three main items, the three main pillars we at AVL could build upon from either existing technologies, tools, mm -hmm know-how capabilities, whatever it might be, that really allowed us more so than anybody else to help aviation get to where they need or help an aerospace company create a battery that they can use for an airplane. But what were those three items? Um, the first one would be safety. Um, safety of the individu individual cassette, as I mentioned, to, to hold any thermal event within the cassette so that it didn't propagate into the rest of the system. Um, the controls to allow the, uh, if there is a problem on an individual cassette that allows the remainder of the airplane um, to to operate successfully, um, mm. that was that's integral to the cassette design. But that development was was particularly important. And then I would say um, understanding what the customer really needs as far as their deliverables. Um, because again, with with the the aerospace applications, they need to supply information to the FAA to allow the airplane to be flight ready. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the things that we do, we didn't completely understand the 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 downstream impact or the downstream need for on many of the things that we are doing that they would they would require downstream. So the safety, the 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 prod, the electronic management, and then. Um, you know, the doc documentation, um, process control, all, all those types of things were the three things that were probably the most important. Sure. And fundamentally, again, what we're saying is these are the things that even though we haven't done those for the, for the aerospace community, we have done similar things or at least a, a smaller or less complex version of it for mobility applications on the ground. And that allowed us then together with obviously lots of simulation capability that we have anyways to then get into the aerospace and ultimately be successful with it. You're right. I mean, they're, those are the top three. But as you mentioned, there are all sorts of the other tools that we had to use to get to the point where we could achieve those three three particular ones. Each, uh -huh. each one of these things did go through you know, mechanical simulation to make sure uh, they passed vib vibration and, and shock. Uh, followed on by physical testing of the things to verify the simulations that we had run. Uh, we supported uh, you know, thermal thermal controls in development, uh, flow analysis of the the supporting cooling plates that that allowed the the system or, or could allow the system to be cooled, um, and then uh, the other simulation tools that go along with the software to simulate that the controls and the software that we're developing did indeed do what they what they were presupposed to do um, mm -hmm. so all of those all of those are true and, and you're right uh, none, none of these are unique to either automotive or aerospace they're used in both i think i think what we what we learned is that the the, the rules aren't different but they're interpreted in a different way uh perhaps that's a, a one one way to think of it is that again if we were if we were making an, a, a production battery Many of the things that we did for this first flight vehicle would be implemented into a manufacturing plan. There's right. no question. Right. But the need for automotive, I'm sorry, the need for aerospace level documentation and monitoring isn't needed on an initial prototype for, for an, auto, an automotive. automotive. Right. And right. I think that's where we really where where our eyes were opened quite a bit is that the level of of need for detail of redundancies and all those things are are much higher for obvious reasons in in an airplane than they are in a car um so learning those things and then understanding how to apply those higher level of monitoring even on a single prototype um is was 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 quite a learning process for us right
So to me, in my experience, in a, in a, in a role that you have, which is sort of the, uh, you're the quarterback, you're the playmaker, right? You're making sure everybody is moving at the right speed with the right things. You're juggling a lot of different balls, a lot of different activities, dealing with the customers. At the end of the day, in my experience, it always comes down again to communication. In this case, it's really the the culmination of a lot of work, but also the the bringing together two different industries as you as you shared, mm-hmm. right? It's not that we're totally different, but we're significant enough different that, oh, I didn't realize this. Oh, we thought we would do it this way. No, you can't do it this way. So tell mm-hmm. me a little bit about, uh, again, the, the consistency of communication is always a challenge in, in any type of program, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe the, the add-on with two industries, maybe two mindsets, two ideas of what, quality, what safety, what documentation is. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, the the tools of communication really were the same. You know, it's it's telephone calls, it's conference calls, it's it's uh, monitoring, timing, using a, a typical Gantt chart. It is uh, meeting minutes of what's described, um, carrying on individual task lists or, or open open items or issues lists. So those tools are are the same. Um, where it became obvious as we we got deeper into the process, many of the things that we're used to in the automotive, the A sample, B sample, in those particular phases are maintained fundamentally. They obviously have different acronyms. We had to, we had to learn a new language uh, to, uh-huh. to fit those. But they do have some particular, uh, I wouldn't call them more important, but they're more obvious milestones and gates as you run through there, they have critical critical reviews and and uh, and specific reviews that are held very very tightly, and recognizing as we went through it those particular reviews which we would normally identify as a uh, as a gate review as you move towards an A sample release or some sort of a milestone review that is uh, in preparation for a validation review or a validation event. These were again the the seed of the documentation that was going to be rolled forward that was going to be necessary much later in the program as they went towards their their documentation package as it goes to the FAA. Oh. Um, so, so many of the things that we again coming from a a more prototyping environment rather than a manufacturing environment we would work with and it would be more of a development and 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 perhaps much more of a fuzzy milestone rather than a a solid milestone. We learn that there are particular criteria that you have to hit as you go through their process that are very, very important, very uh, document or, or, or very important to be documented properly in the proper formats, in the proper way. Um, and, and those were those were items that we had to adapt to um, be this two items for us, you know, first time in the aerospace and then the first time with aviation as a customer. Um, so it was them teaching us their environment, their industry, so that we could support them for the needs that they had. Uh-huh. Uh, so those those were those were not not uh, not difficult, but they were definitely learning and learning steps for us that uh, that we well, again we comprehended that they were going to start there, but we didn't perhaps fully understand the depth of the of the detail that was necessary. Right. And I think we see similar things, right? You guys work on, or we work on military type application. We work with, with marine applications. Now, all in the electrification space, mm-hmm. you mentioned very early on stationary power, which one way or the other has a battery as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so every single industry, though, connected one way or the other to the mobility space or directly mobility space has a little bit of its if it's uniqueness, which certainly for you probably makes it uh, exciting because it's different and always the same. Right. At the same time, probably also challenging because it's then your responsibility to teach our team, our part of the overall project team that things may not always go as if they as as they've been done for the last ten years. So, right. what what maybe thinking along that line? What has been the most surprising to you? On on how fast our team, the AVL team, has has adapted to, uh, I don't know, new requirements, uh, the new milestones you just shared, mm-hmm. the new uh, safety consciousness or additional safety consciousness. Uh, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I'm missing something. But to you, one or two examples that that actually surprised you how well we adjusted to it, or or yeah, yeah. I it's it is interesting. I, 
everyone here has has they came to AVL through automotive backgrounds, some you know, be it in transportation or passenger vehicles, even medium and heavy duties. So most everyone here has that kind of a history. So you use that as a baseline for whatever project you you go into. And so everything is a uh, an add-on or, or, or I should say an amendment to what we already know. We use our baseline mm-hmm. knowledge and then we move forward identifying the exceptions. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the documentation, the milestones, et cetera, for the aerospace are a good example of you you start with what you know and then you learn what you don't. Um, so a couple examples of that, um, you know, the the learnings for the documentation for the aerospace, that's an easy example because we just we we worked through that over the past year. Everyone, the, the engineering function tends to take learning as a good challenge. I mean, that's that's kind of what we are. We like to learn stuff and do new things. So that was never a problem to to learn something. It was never a problem. The problem is always you don't know what you don't know. Um, so we can learn something new, but it's, as you imagine, if you if you're getting into the automotive industry for the first time, you pull out the uh, the, the FMVSS book and try and look at all the requirements for what a car is. But that doesn't teach you how to design a car. So you can look at all the recommendations and requirements and and, and rules for airplane approvals, but that doesn't teach you how to design an airplane. All right. Um, so you have to. It, it's somewhat of a trial by fire working with the customer to understand what they need so that you can interpret that based upon your existing knowledge and then put it into their terms. Um, that's that's always a give and take. And, and Eviation knew that we weren't an aerospace company, so they were more than willing to work with us to do that. So that was never any sort of stress or any sort of uh, any sort of, of, of problems with that. But that didn't mean that through osmosis they could just give us all of their knowledge Mm. Uh, so it was it was you we couldn't understand where we were falling short until we stumbled across the problem and then we had to adapt and learn to it Mm. so in this particular example i think it was uh pretty clear that we we had a comprehension of where we were uh needing needing to learn new areas and so once we stumble across something, the guys, the team very, very quickly were able to say, OK, I, now I now I know what I need to learn. Now I understand what I need to change or alter or expand and I can go into it. So that was that was satisfying for all of us that we were able to take our existing knowledge and, and adapt and learn in, into a new area. Okay. Um, a, a, another example is is the stationary power which is, yes, it's a battery. Yes, it's some sort of a power generation unit. Um, but the rules for implementing such a thing become very different when you're either you know, in a car or now you have to actually tie it to the to the ground, which seems easier, but then you need to understand uh, the grid tie implications, the transformers, the all, all the requirements to get it onto the grid, not just to create energy and drive itself down the road independently. And then you have the additional steps of is there a some sort of a third party inspection? Is there a safety requirement? Um, what are the rules, uh, uh, the fire codes? What are the rules for perhaps the individual city or, or the community that you're installing? the part on Mm. so that now you have to now you're into building uh building requirements now you're getting permits all of those things that you never think of or you perhaps never want to think of when you're building an initial prototype or initial proof of concept but to allow the customer to truly implement what you have those are the items that that can make make you stumble uh when you didn't even think there was going to be a problem right right so pretty much to summarize to summarize our our discussion here, it required a lot of flexibility not only on your part, uh, but also on the part of technology, the customers, and just as a team. Right? We needed to be flexible. We needed to be willing to to really work together as a team and uh, and and take a challenge as they as they came. And again, as you just mentioned, in the stationary power, very much now suddenly we're not dependent on maybe a an FAA regulation or a, or a NHTSA regulation or whatever it might be. Now we're suddenly based on different cities have different requirements for different types of stationary powers, et cetera. So, yeah. uh, and, that, and that industry is new to everyone who's being involved in it. So it's not as if there's a standard that can be written that says, hey, if you're going to put a, 
electrical power generation here. Here's the standards and rules that you do. So the same with with aviation. They were learning and working with the FAA to create the regulations that we were trying to comply to yeah. even before they were written. So right. part of part of what we stumble across in many projects over the years is that we're creating new technologies, new applications of technology that people don't uh, they have no experience with, and right. so they don't right. know how they don't know how to implement it safely or uh, get it into a, a state where the rest of the world will recognize it as as being a safe product. Yeah. So there is education for us as the product, education to the customer for what they're going to achieve with the product uh, performance, et cetera. And then there's also education for what happens to that product after or how to even implement it on the road or in a building. Right. Perfect ending. This is exactly what it is when we talk about reimagining mobility, right? And leading through technology leadership. So perfect summary here to the end. Good. Thank you, Phil. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Very welcome. Thank, thanks, Stefan. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you liked this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.